Then I want to move on to assessment. Um, you have two, two articles in your pack. One is by me and one is by my colleague, Julie Meyer. They're both about uh, a philosophy of assessment. And my question on the slide is, why do people assess children with charge syndrome? And the next slide comes up with the most, the most common reasons people do it. To determine need or eligibility for services. And of course, eligibility is a big, big issue, particularly when children are first being placed in an educational program. Uh, to provide a baseline of current skills, current knowledge, and perhaps uh, experiences. To identify the supports and services which are needed by the child. To provide a guide for intervention and instructional techniques. To measure the child's growth and skills. To evaluate the effectiveness of the teaching and to present the child to other people, to get a really good picture of the child. Unfortunately, because children with charge aren't incredibly common, most educational professionals have never met a child with charge before. They probably never heard of the syndrome. So they, they might not have a very good idea where to start and where to approach. And I know Nancy has dealt with this uh, issue uh, very much from the perspective of a school psychologist. But I think that the assessment processes that people tend to use, not very effectively, come partly because charge is rare, but also the population of children with charge covers a very wide spectrum of ability and disability. So there's an enormous range of things to be to be assessed and to be explored and um, I sometimes talk about the children needing to get horizontal someone will say to me oh we're working with a 16 year old girl and she never lays down well that's fine I'm not saying everyone does uh, because there is this enormous variety and the variety can come with age but it can also come with the particular complex of anomalies that the child has. Um, the behaviors of the children are often very idiosyncratic and people see odd behaviors or weird behaviors, but they don't have an ability to understand what those behaviors mean and what they're telling us. Uh, people doing assessments usually only know one type of assessment process and it might not be a very good helpful one for the child with charge. Uh, they often have limited resources and assessment tools available, and they often forget the real point of the assessment procedure. So the kind of approach that I would recommend, I would say it's pretty unusual. It's very positive. It looks at the child's existing positive skills and positive achievements. It looks at the child's learning styles. It looks at their preferences and their interests to give me an idea of their motivators. It looks at the whole child and it credits the child all the time with intelligence. Even if they do something that we think is weird or bizarre, it's good to think that it has meaning and the child has a reason for doing it. And our job is to work out what that reason is. My view of assessment seeks to improve our understanding of the child and work out who they are. It also seeks to help us to build a positive relationship with the child. By assessing the child this way, I acquire tools and ideas which I can use to help the child relax with me possibly like me and enjoy being with me so that we get a positive relation built up rather than the child perceiving me as someone who comes along and tries to make them do things they don't want to do, can't do, or are not interested in. It seeks to help us know what to teach and how best to teach it. And it seeks to give us a clear focus for measuring progress. And 
in an article I wrote in 2001, I suggested the best way to start assessing a child is to ask four basic questions. How do you feel? What do you like? What do you want? And what do you do? The first question, how do you feel? Because these children's functioning is highly variable. They have amazingly good and amazingly bad days and good and bad moments. And I would like the people who know the child best to let me know, am I meeting the child at a particularly good day or a particularly bad day? Um, what's their health like? What's their emotional state like? What is their arousal level like? What do you like? Gives me an idea of motivators. And I'm a teacher. I want to know what kids like because I'm going to use that to build a relationship and to get them interested. What do you want? Gives me an idea of the child's existing expressive behaviors. How do I know the child likes something? How do I know the child dislikes something? How do I know the child's getting and we need to stop and change tack? Those, those kinds of, of questions. And then the last question is probably the most important one. What do you do? One of the most important early assessment questions we can ask of the child is, what do you do? And the, the most typical educator's question is, what can you do? Because people think of assessment as seeing what a child can do rather than seeing what a child does do. And it's okay to ask the question, what can you do? And to intervene, to start seeing where you can stretch the child. You, you've moved from assessment into a kind of testing approach, which is an important part of the whole assessment procedure. But I wouldn't see that as a good place to begin the relationship. Now, I've got a couple of slides based on a child I worked with many years ago um, when I still worked in London. And we were all submitting reports. So there was a large professional team involved. And I got copies of all the reports before the, the program meeting. And I was struck by how negative the reports were in their observations and in their comments. And I was pretty dismayed because I feel that report is meant to make a positive contribution to the work of the team, including the parents, to design an appropriate program. What these statements were doing in the professionals' reports was quite the opposite. And I picked out some of the statements, and I'm going to read them to you from this first slide. Refuses to look at faces. The moment that word refuses comes out, you've got a value judgment. This is not an assessment of a child. This is a judgment of a child. And it doesn't leave you with a positive view of what are you going to do about that in the educational program. The only clue it gives you is that you've got to make the child look at faces. But it doesn't give you an, any idea how to do that. It doesn't give you an idea why the child is refusing to look at faces. It doesn't even give you an idea whether the child is refusing or whether the child can't look at faces. So that negativity comes over overwhelmingly. The next statement, dislikes her hands being touched. Again, it's negative. It might be true, but it doesn't give you an idea where to go other than oh, you're going to have to teach this child to like having her hands touched, but where, where do you start? Fed by G-Tube. Okay, that's a comment that's useful to know, but again, this doesn't give you a lot of useful information for teaching. Uh, low muscle tone and refuses to sit up. Again, we have the word refuses. Now, is the child refusing or is sitting up so challenging and so threatening to the child 
that they just are not able to do it confidently and focus on other things. Low, uh, sucks her fingers most of the time. Uh, that is okay, but I think it needs to be expanded a little more to make it a little more positive as an observation. To me, that's a very judgmental sentence when it stops there. Refuses to watch other people so cannot imitate. Again, it, it's judgmental and it doesn't give you a, a direction to go other than, are you going to teach the child to watch other people? But how are you going to teach that? Shows no awareness of bowel movements. Okay. Rocks side to side a lot. And again, there's a statement with no follow through to give you an idea what that might mean. And then uh, to blow my own trumpet, I looked at my report on the same child at the same time. And I picked out some of the statements from my report. Likes to be flat on her back. I then extrapolated on that. And what that tells me is that flat on her back is probably where I'd like this child to be when I introduce myself to her. It's perfectly all right to assess a child when she's flat on her back on the floor. She doesn't have to be on a chair at a table. She doesn't have to be sitting upright. She doesn't have to be sitting on her mum or dad's lap held at the hips like so many assessment approaches uh, insist that has to be done enjoys looking at lights a positive feature of the child she likes being flat on her back she enjoys looking at lights often kicks her heels hard on the floor we can assume this is something she enjoys or something she feels she needs to do it's good to know she has that control over her legs and it's interesting that she kicks them very hard. So she's probably needing a lot of deep pressure inputs. She often pats or rubs her hands on her head. Right. There's something else me, what we might want to try. Maybe I can copy her and rub my hands on my head. Or maybe she'll allow me to rub my hands or pat my hands on her head if it's done in an appropriate, non-threatening way grinds her teeth. In other words, she's looking for a diet of strong proprioceptive pressure input. We're starting to get a picture of sensory needs and how this child is coping to give herself those sensory needs. Likes rocking and bouncing. Likes rocking and bouncing. So again, maybe we can do a lot of rhythmic movement with this child in order to build a relationship. And maybe we can build in a stop-start pattern to signal to the child that we've stopped and it's her turn to request more rocking or more bouncing. Holds objects very close to her eyes for visual scrutiny. That gives you something to think about if you're trying to get her to use her vision, rather than refuses to look at people refuses to make eye contact. Enjoys being squeezed hard. We're back to deep pressure. Moves by back scooting and rolling. Okay, we're going to allow that when we try to promote moving from one spot and seeing if we can get her to follow us or follow a light. That's the kind of movement we will allow because that seems to be her favorite way of moving, possibly her only way of moving. Travels around familiar areas, but usually returns to the rug next to her mother's chair. So the idea that this child doesn't know anybody, doesn't know her parents from anybody else, which is what I'd been told, didn't seem to be true on my home visits because she always came back to her mum, however far she travelled around the sitting room. Loves the family dog. Well, okay, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to incorporate the dog in the program. But if she likes the family dog, maybe she likes dogs. And maybe in the future we can build lessons 
around dogs if we're working on eye contact, picture communication, um, early maths, early literacy, we can use dogs. And finally, vocalize is more in a smaller room or when underneath a chair or a table, which to me suggests that she's hearing her voice better when she's in a confined space. And it's just one hopefully useful observation for the hearing side of things that didn't come out of any of the other reports that I looked at. So I've, I've gone through those comments just to try and show you how you can be positive in the things you observe and the things you report and how essential those positive comments are in order to give ideas for structuring an approach to the child and how those negative judgmental comments don't take you anywhere except down the wrong path and you're setting up a battle of wills with the child. The outcome of a, an assessment doesn't have to be a big formal legalistic document. I mean, there's a place for that. There's obviously a place for the individualized educational plan. Uh, I write reports sometimes that are, are, get quite formal and are organized very carefully. But in the, the, the next two slides, you'll see one outcome of an assessment approach like I'm recommending, produced by a family I know for their son. It's just a simple two-sided trifold uh, about this boy, the stage he was at at the time, the do's and don'ts, the things he likes, specifically about some of his medical and nursing type issues, which are very high level and very important. And a little bit, especially about his vision, which had been causing concern for the, for the family. Um, it's, it's very personal. It's very easy to read. And by the time you've read it, you get a real feel of who this boy is. And that, I put that in just to make the point that assessment can work on multiple levels and the outcome of an assessment can be something very practical and very down to earth and very individual.